Well, good morning, Renewal Church, and happy Sunday to you today. Morning. morning. We're so happy to have you here today. We're thank you guys for getting out of the bed on a cold morning and coming to worship Jesus. Amen. He's worth it, right? He's every bit of worth it. I was driving to church this morning, cold weather, enjoying the cold winter season that we're having, singing Oh Holy Night, and just enjoying the, the Christmas season that we're in, and um, God's good, right? God's good. Amen. Amen. Let's pray and get ready for him to meet us here today. Father God, we love you. And Father God, we ask for you to just come and be a part of us today, God. God, you're here. God, I pray for you to just speak to us in a mighty way today, Jesus. Show up in our worship, God. Show up in our word. Thank you for this, this sermon, God. Thank you for the, the, uh, just the word that you're giving to us, this acts of peace and love and forgiveness that we're learning about so that we can walk out here a changed person and forgive and love this community. In Jesus' name, amen.
it's a love we don't deserve but you keep chasing us down you find us in the midst of our mess anyway you leave nothing behind just to come to us and when you find us you rejoice and all we have to do is trust in you because you're tearing down the walls you're lighting up the shadows you're making a way in our life when it doesn't seem like there is one but you fight and in you we see the victory and in you we can lift our hands and shout us recklessly and it's one of the greatest ways to describe your love for us it's a love that's beyond understanding or comprehension but it's felt and it's shown and you're constantly making a way in our lives you're constantly finding us and we feel alone you let us know that you're there in our fire that you're there in our battle God there is none like you you alone are worthy to be praised God God be with us this morning as we receive your word may it touch us mind, body, spirit, heart In your holy and powerful name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope that uh, you are stayed warm, right? How hard was it for us to get up today? Amen. I mean, seriously. So we can just think about this 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 logic right now. So we can hunker down in a Category Five hurricane, right? But yet in Florida, if it hits forty degrees, oh, we ain't going nowhere, right? We will wait till the, till the right before the hurricane hits land, and we'll say, hey, let's go find some water, just, just, just in case. But, you know, it's just crazy how I mean, it hits 40, and we're all, like, just freezing. Um, let me say this to you. We're going to, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter number 6 is our main text. But I want to I wanna start off by saying, you know, uh, this is a crazy time. I don't know about you, but I'm watching the news from time to time. I'm seeing things that happen, and I just shake my head because I'm, I'm honestly in disbelief. And, but i got to be honest with you. 2020 is not that bad. I got, seriously, 20, my 2017 was a lot worse. You know what I mean? 2020, I mean, we're almost here. I think this is the only time, and I can think that I'm actually excited Christmas is around the corner. You know why? Because we're almost done. Amen? Amen. Just, get this, just get this year packed up and gone. Um, it's just crazy. But, but I'm, I'm asking myself this question. I'm, I'm going, why are we in the situation that we're in today? Because I feel like as a pastor, i got to answer that question somehow. Whether I make it up or if I have a real legitimate answer, i gotta, I got to come up with something, right? Like, like what, why is it that we're in the place that we're in? I want to read something to you that I read years ago when I was in college, and it just, it just it, I don't say it shook me, but it just it threw me off. Because so many times we, we talk about church, and we're like, okay, church is, you know, when you go to church, it should be about love, and it is, and it should be about warmness and, and warm fuzzies, right, and, and chicken soup for your soul, right? Let me read a verse to you that's going to rock that theology. This, this, is, this is Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Just listen to what he says. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. And I was thinking about that text, and I was thinking about that passage, and I go, the kingdom of heaven is filled with violent people who come in and try to snatch it away. You ever thought about what it takes for a person to come to Christ? Think about all of the roadblocks that comes and happens to a person that, that God is speaking to and calling them. Listen, and then the Satan comes in and tries to attack that person to stop them from getting to the realization of who Jesus is. A lot of violent acts take place before that happens. You know, I was thinking about, like, just for our church, I mean, how much violence did it take for us to get up out of bed today? <laughs> Listen, the best fights in marriage happen, you ready? Sunday morning driving to church. <laughs> some, some trips can turn violent. You understand? We, I mean, it, you have to understand, there is, and the reason why it's so violent, or you ever said to yourself, why is it that it seems like every time I do something good for God, it seems like, man, I'm always, there's always something fighting me. Every time I take a step toward the Lord, it just seems like, man, there's just violence that happens in my life. Because, listen, the, you live in a violent culture, and it's called the church. You listen, it wasn't a group of people sitting around, hey, there's a guy walking down with long hair and sandals. Let's just follow him. He's singing Kumbaya by the fire. <laughs> His name is Jesus. Let's do this. And Jesus said to the disciples, let's plant daisies and, and, and let's just have, let's just do arts and crafts today. <laughs> no, he goes, if you follow me, you're going to lose it all. And here's what they said. I'm in. So you know the church is made up of weird people. But Jesus said, you follow me, violence is going to take place. And they said, I will follow you till the ends of the earth. See, here's the problem. The problem with our church today and our world today, it's not the world. It's you and I. It's me and you. It's us. 
Because what we've done is we've raised our children in church and we told them, if you are good little boys and girls, then everything's going to be great. And then they go out into the world and they realize the world is chaotic and it's evil and it's mean and it's nasty and it's corrupt. See, if you do any kind of study on like civilizations, there's one particular group of people that, it, that just fascinates me, and it's the Spartans. Now, maybe you guys have watched that movie 300 on TBS, because I know none of you Christians went to the movie theater and watched that movie unedited. And there's that story where you had 300 Spartans that were in this narrow gap. And as the Persians are coming to fight them and, 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 and fight the, Spurgeons, uh, the, the, the Spartans, they were able to stand in a gap of 300 men and hold off basically for days an entire army. Incredible story. But do you know how the Spartans came up with their culture? They raised their children, listen, to be warriors. From the minute those kids were born, they said, your life, your job is number one to protect our culture and to protect your people and to protect your lands and to protect your family. So they were sent off at a very early age learning how to use a sword. We have issues with kids with guns right now, like right? Not cap guns, right? Remember when cap guns were cool? Remember when you, did, when you could buy a gun, a cap gun, and not have an orange thing at the end of it? Yep. This is why, this is why, I, remember when you could ride your bike without a helmet? Yep. <laughs> see, I'm, see where I'm going with this? We, we haven't taught our children that this world is violent. We haven't taught our children that this world is mean and nasty. And so we've given them these dreams, and the reality is we haven't, we haven't prepared them for what they're about to face. You know, there's a story in the Bible where, where the men were, 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 were rebuilding the walls of, of Jerusalem as they, they fell down. And the Bible says that they had a, a, a mason's trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. And they said basically at any moment's notice they had to stop fixing the, the, the wall and they had to turn around and fight. So it's like this. We haven't taught our kids how to fight. And that's why they're being slaughtered. In our, in, our, in our culture. They don't know where to stand. They don't know where to look. We just keep giving these, this, this fluff. And we haven't told them that you're a part of an organization that Satan and the, this, this world system absolutely hates. You're in a war. And i got to teach you. And we have to teach the next generation how to fight and how to survive. A Spartan mom would say to her son as he's going off to war to fight for the, its nation, she would say, son, may you come back with your shield or your body lay on your shield. That was their attitude. You come back and you defend this nation, and if you don't do it, may you come back and then put, put your body, your dead body, on top of the shield and bring you back to home so we can bury you. And I'm just afraid that in our culture and this whole idea that, that we're seeing, we, we feel like we're, we're ill-prepared because we really are, because no one's taught us that, that, that you know what, to take things back, it, you might have to be a little violent. Now, when I use the word violent, don't think violence what you see, because how we fight is, our violence is different. Let me explain to you what I mean by we fight violently. There's a story in the Bible where Jacob is about to meet his brother Esau. And the Bible says that, 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 that the angel of the Lord, which is really Jesus, comes to him in the, in the night and, 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 and meets with him. And he's talking with Jesus. And he's like, Jesus, you know, he didn't say Jesus. He goes, he goes, Lord, will you bless me? Will you bless me? He's, he's there. He's, you know, I'm nervous that Esau's going to kill me, but I, 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 need, I need something. And so the, light, the morning light was coming up, and the, and, and the Lord said, I have to leave. And Jacob does this. He grabs the feet of, of the Lord, and he goes, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the Bible says that he wrestled with the Lord. Listen to me. He wrestled with the Lord. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord reached down and touched his hip. Listen to this. Touched his hip and said, okay, I will bless you, but you will forever walk with a limp. And forever from that moment on, the, the Jacob said, this place is, is basically the place where I've seen the face of the Lord and I've lived. And forever the rest of his days, the Bible says that he walked with a limp. Here's the problem. 
Not enough people in church walk with limps. We don't wrestle with the Lord because we don't understand that what we're about to do and what we're engaged in is completely violent. Mm -hmm. Think about it. When you watch a football game, at the end of the football game, everybody wants to do interviews, right? After, and so you never, you never ever see the news media go up, go up behind someone who at the, like the winning team and they find the person with the cleanest uniform. Hey, you, uh, you sat on the bench all game, so how was it? <laughs> Man, I tell you, I was sitting in one spot, and, and my rear end got numb, and I had, to, I had to get up and walk around. I tell you. No, they go to the dude with his, his uniforms all beat up and ripped and blood and dirt, and they're like, Man, what a great game. Here's the problem. We have too many people in our churches with nice uniforms. Not enough of us are willing to play the game. Not enough of us are willing to defend and, and do what we're supposed to do. And this is the problem that we're in. The problem that we're in is that we are in a battle. We are in a war, but the church hasn't prepared the people for the war. We've given you chicken soup for the soul and told you, you know what? Just go out and be good little people, and God will bless you. He'll take care of your health. He'll take care of your wealth, and he'll give you whatever your dreams desire. And God says, no, it's violence. Now, with all that said, I got this to say to you. There is a way for you to fight this war and for you to win. But the difference is, is you're going to have to do it the way God tells you. Because if you don't do it the Lord's way, he, the, the world is going to eat your lunch. So would you like to study some more about spiritual warfare? No, I, we'll go home. I've already preached this once. Y'all can watch it on, 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 on Facebook if it's not censored, but I mean, I'm just saying it. You guys want to hear this, this, what we're going to get into? Yeah. All right, there's three of us. Here we go. <clears throat> Here's your text, Ephesians 6. Here's what the Bible says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because you're in a war. Right? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, in other words, that word therefore means because what I just said, you have to do this. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth the very first thing you have to put on is your belt of truth. You have to know what truth is. You have to, you got to understand that there is a, 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 a war going on that I don't even think you realize, but there's people out there that are trying to tell you what their truth is. And you have to be able to discern what is truth and what is not. And you have to be able to say, God, I want to know what I'm really looking at. Keep reading. It says this. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances. How many circumstances? That means you got to get up. you got to, in, in every situation. But it's not that bad. It can turn bad. Right? You ever have something small blow up in your face? Now, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Right? I don't know what you're talking about. I just read this in books. <laughs> right? He says, in all circumstances, take up your shield of faith. Now, now I just told you about the shield. The shield is going to be basically, it's not like a little shield. It's a big shield. The Roman shield was huge, almost like a door. And they would stand behind, they would lock shields, and they would stand behind their, the, 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 their, their shield, and it would protect them from the attack of the enemy. The problem is we're not standing behind our shield of faith. Now, if I were to ask you this question, what is faith? What is faith? Mostly, most Christians will say this. Well, faith is just believing in God. Let me tell you something. If you think your faith is believing in God, let me say this to you. Satan believes in God, yes or no? So your faith is no greater than Satan's. So it has to be more than just believing it has to be more than just recognizing who God is. Even Satan walks into God's presence, as we learn in the series, and recognizes who God is. So what is faith? What, what, what does it look like? 
So I read this story about a missionary. I just, it just, I, I loved it. It said this: When a missionary John Patton was translating the scriptures for South Sea Islanders, he was unable to find a word in their vocabulary for the concept of believing, trusting, or having faith. He had no idea how he would convey it. And then one day he was working in his hut, and a native came running into Patton study, flopped into a chair, exhausted, and this is what he said: "It feels so good to rest my whole weight." in this chair. And then instantly John Patton knew that he had the definition. Faith was resting your whole weight on God. You know what faith is? Faith is taking everything you have and putting it and entrusting it in the Lord. Everything. Listen to me. Everything. Your finances, your marriage, your job, your children, your well-being, your mental capacity, <laughs> literally everything. When you can't make sense of it all, having faith is trusting in God's character that he will, he will handle it and that he will take care of it. A lot of us, we struggle with this idea of faith. Habakkuk says this in chapter 2. He goes, the righteous will live by faith. There's a requirement of God that we as his people live by faith. That's why he says every circumstance you pick up the shield of faith and you stand behind your faith because you need to realize that when you're behind your faith, when your faith is what protects you. When, when you walk into that new church building and you stand in those walls and you stand in that auditorium and you stand in that lobby, here's what I want you to know. Every single ounce of that building was built on faith. Because I'm going to tell you, in the beginning of 2017, I had no desire to build a building. I had no desire to start a church. But God said, I have plans for you. And what started in 2017 and how it ended in 2017 were two different ways that I thought it was going to be. But I, with trusting the Lord with what he was doing, now I can look back and say that was the greatest journey we've ever been on. Because Hebrews says it this way, faith is what you can't see. You, you don't know how it's going to end. So you trust what God is doing. And that's why he says that you standing behind your faith, is, 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 that's what you do. That's what protects you. So you do crazy stuff. You ready for this? Like you forgive people. Why? Because he tells me to forgive. Why should I forgive them, Lord? Because I forgave you. He tells you to do stuff like, I want you to be generous to that person. You're like, why? But you know he's telling you to do these things. Sometimes he tells us to quit jobs. Sometimes he tells us to start jobs. Right? Sometimes he tells us, don't give up on your marriage. Sometimes he says, don't stop praying. Sometimes he says, go to church. You're going to need to hear this message. Why? Faith. Have you heard Jason? He's a great preacher. <laughs> I know y'all all heard that, right? <laughs> Hebrews says it this way. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. There are things that I don't understand, but I have a conviction about. I don't know how 2021 is going to look, but I know this. I'm not going to change the way I'm doing in my life. I'm going to trust him with faith. Listen, we all make mistakes. We all do stupid things. But I know God's greater. So, but let me say this to you. But faith isn't just enough. Because you can say to me, Pastor, I have great faith. And there's people that will do this. They'll say, oh, I have all the faith. I know God of faith, 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 faith. But here's the problem. Faith without works is what? Dead. It's dead faith. In other words, there's got to be another element to your faith that makes your faith even stronger. So there's this thing. I don't know if you've ever seen it in, in Home Depot or, or you go to a job site. And usually uh, these guys that do like, like concrete work or whatever, they need a stone to stick or they need something really strong to hold something. They have this, 
usually it's a two-part epoxy, and they had this cool little syringe that, that when they, they squeeze it together, it makes a cute little circle, right? And it squeezes together, and then it comes out one particular thing together, and then it has a, a, like the ability for to hold like, you know, heavy things, like really, really strong. Better than, than Flex Seal, just saying, okay? <laughs> so your faith, listen, your faith is good, but there's another element to your faith we call obedience. That when those faith and obedience go hand in hand and work together, nothing can stop that faith. You have to be, that's why he says, faith without works is dead. It's faith without obedience. You got to do something. You, you can't just say, well, I, I love Jesus. I mean, show me. Well, we're a church. Okay, show me. Well, I'm a part of an incredible organization, an incredible church called Renewal. And, and, okay, show me. What makes it so great? What are you guys doing that makes it great? Show me your faith. Show me what you believe. Because that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He goes, he goes you want to follow me? You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And they say, yes. And then we say, next week. You with me? So you got to have obedience. In other words, when you're, he says, pick, take up your shield, that means you got to do something. Pick it up. You, if, it, if it lays on the ground, it does nothing for you. There is no protection. you got to do something. And I'm just going to tell you, one day a week here is not going to help you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or even Saturday. you got to do something more than just today. Wouldn't it be great to come up with a, like a, if you want to lose weight, let's just have, if, listen, just, just diet for one day and then you can eat whatever you want for six. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great diet? Yes. You can have your keto, right? I'm on the one day diet. It doesn't work. And the same way in your faith doesn't work. If you just exercise your faith one hour, and you don't do anything else with it, it's no good. You have to do something with it. It's almost like this. You know, faith, faith will call you to do crazy stuff. Think about the crazy stories in the Bible. One of them is the Battle of Jericho. You ever thought about that story? Joshua takes the, the children of Israel across, and they're getting ready to fight their very first battle. I mean, they're getting ready to fight and go to war. It's going to get violent. You know what he says? March. What? March around it. And then on the seventh day, I, here's what I want you to do. March around seven times and then blow your trumpet. Can you imagine what it looked like for the first six days? All the people in Jericho were going, these people are crazy. Are they attacking? No, they're walking around. Where'd they go? I don't know. I guess it was lunchtime. They're gone. They have siestas in Israel? Yeah, I know it's crazy. And then on the seventh day, what happens? They blow their trumpets and the walls fall. It's never happened before. First time you've ever seen anything like that. And God says, well, that's, the, that's what I can do with faith. Matter of fact, Hebrews says it this way. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down, and they had encircled for seven days. By faith. But here's what's crazy. Don't over-spiritualize what I'm saying, because sometimes people say, okay, you know what? If, if the walls fell down and that happened seven times, then I got to take that seven times. I got to do something. So like, if you see a house that you want to live in, just don't start walking around the person's house for seven days. Because <laughs> you know what's going to happen? The walls aren't going to fall. You're going to get arrested. <laughs> and then your marching will go in an eight by ten cell. <laughs> Sometimes what God does for somebody isn't always what he does for somebody else. That's why Jesus really never, never healed the same way that you see in scriptures for every person. Everybody was like different. Like some people, it was like, it just grab the hem of his garment and, and they were healed. For other people, it was like, I, you know, will you, will you, you know uh, I think the, the, the centurion goes, will you just heal from here? Will you just heal my servant? And from there, Jesus says he's healed. And then there's a dude who's completely blind, like life's not going good for him. And what does Jesus do? Spits in the ground. Makes mud, rubs it in his eye. Like, dude, what did you do to get that? And the, the reason why you see that is because God's saying, I'm not limited by what I can do. 
I'm only limited by your faith. I think sometimes we forget that. It's, it's our faith that stops us from doing and seeing God do big things. But check this out. When you pick up the shield of faith and you stand behind your faith, it protects you from everything. There's not a single thing that Satan can do to you. It's almost like back in the day, there's a, there's a, there's a, a boxer called uh, uh, Cassius Clay who changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And if you ever watch any of those old fights with him, he would he would you know he was he was a showman he was a great showman but he would he and a great boxer but he would they would they would swing and they'd miss and he's like he's moving his head see God's calling you to move your head but you're like what <laughs> hit me see, see see God wants you to be like Muhammad Ali you guys are too much like Rocky sometimes <laughs> hit me hit me hit me But that's what the shield of faith does. The shield of faith protects you. And, he's, and, and no matter how, he goes, it will quench all of the fiery darts from Satan. As long as you stand behind your faith, listen to me, he can't touch you. The minute you lay your faith down, the minute you just put it down, he's got you. God says, if you rest everything that you believe in me, I will protect you. I'll tell you right now, church. When I tell you I had no intention of planting a church, I am telling you I had no intention of planting a church. When I tell you I had no intentions of being on this path that God has us, I had no intentions of being here. Do you know why I did it? Because God told us to do it. This is what I want you to do. Why, God? Why do you want us to do this? We don't have anything. We we're, we're meeting we're meeting in the upper room on in, you know on on chairs we don't own in a pulpit we don't own using the equipment we don't own we don't have a, a penny in the bank, and God says, "Do you trust me?" Say, yes, Lord, we trust you. When the world says there's a pandemic going to hit and and you got to stop preaching, stop meeting, you know what we did? We said we're going to do a drive-in. And then we, all of our guys were sitting around there like, drive-in, yes. And Matt's our youngest. Matt goes, what's a drive-in? <laughs> we had to explain to him what a drive-in. He goes, oh, like Greece. <laughs> Matt loves musicals, evidently. <clears throat> you just get creative. And you go, okay, if this is not how we're going to, we have to do it a different way. Okay, Lord, show us what you want us to do. Because here was the conviction. The faith was that you, you called us to worship you, and we have to do whatever we can to worship you. And God says, if you get creative and think outside the box, I'll give you the means by which you can do it. Whenever you walk into that new building on Affy Lane, please don't walk in there thinking that we did it. Walk in there that every single thing in this building was done by faith. And we take no credit for anything. Spiritual victories are only achieved when faith and obedience are working together. Let me, let me just give you this real quick. Not all the outcomes of life are going to be what you desire. That's why faith is so important, because sometimes things will happen to you, and you'll say, well, why, do, why is this person being blessed, and why is this person being blessed, or how come I don't, I don't get this the way? We, we, we compare each other, and we shouldn't do that. The Apostle Paul says this, when he was, he was asking the guy, he had this ailment or, the, and this, um, or, or a, a, a person, a messenger of Satan sent to strike him is how the text says it. It could be an ailment. Some people think it was that. Some people think it was actually a guy that followed Paul around everywhere he went to preach the gospel and just was there to beat him up. And he said, for three times I asked the Lord to take this thing from me, to take this thorn in the flesh away from me. And three times God said, no, this is Paul. Paul is the guy that preached the message and Eutychus fell out three stories up, right? Fell down to the ground and, and died. And what does Paul do? Walks over, heals him, raises him from the dead and keeps on preaching. And God, he's like, God, I've done all these things for you. You can't take care of this for me? He goes, because in your weakness, I am strong. Let me tell you something that might blow you away. If I were to ask you, what is... 
What is the one thing that God just loves the most? Okay? What's the, don't answer out loud, but just think about it. If, I, if, you, if you were to take a test and someone said, okay, write down what you think Jesus loves the most in this entire earth. Well, he loves people. But yeah, let's be a little bit more specific than just people. Can I tell you what he loves? He loves your faith. He loves your faith. He is always working on your behalf to grow your faith. He calls you to do great things. That's why he always is challenging your faith. Let me read this text to you. It says this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. It says, so that, the testing of, uh, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He loves your faith. He loves it when he says to you, I want you in faith to go do this. And then you trust him, and then you go and do it, and then God says, this is where I'm going to bless. Can I tell you something? That's where he operates. He operates in your faith. Man, I wish he didn't do that. I wish God would just give me a road map sometimes. Okay, okay once you get here, then this will be there. And then, one, then you go from there to here. And th that's how we think. But God goes, take that off the table. Just trust me. And he says it's more precious than gold. That means that's why he's always testing your faith. That's why you continue to go through these trials and tribulations because he's improving your faith and growing your faith because eventually you're going to do something that's crazy. And when you get to heaven and you stand before him and you say, God, why did you put me through all those trials and tribulations? He's going to say, check out this gold. Look at this. Look what we were able to produce. When you were faithful and obedient to me, we produced this because of your faith. You have to understand that that's so important. God loves your faith. Hebrews 11, is, we call this the, the hall of faith. But a lot of times we read all the big names in this, in this story. Let me read something to you at the end of, of Hebrews 11. And just think about this. Because sometimes... We think we know, but we really don't know. Hebrews 11, verse 32, the Bible says this, And what more shall I say? Talking about the faith and the, 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 the saints. From time would fa uh, for time would fail me to give Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Japheth, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets. For through faith conquered kingdoms. Through their faith they conquered kingdoms. Through their faith they conquered kingdoms. Through their faith, they conquered kingdoms. Through their faith, they did what? You know why? Because taking heaven is a, it's violent sometimes. And you have to conquer things sometimes. And sometimes you have to overpower things. And your faith does that. It overpowers the will of men. And, and, and submits us to, to, to God. He says this, he goes, Through their faith, they conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, Stop the mouths of lions. Hello? Listen, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Now listen. He goes, by faith, a lot of things happened that were incredible. A lot of victories were obtained. But he says this, Because of faith, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. Sometimes your faith will cause you harm, bodily harm. And he says this, They were stoned, not you know, that kind of... <laughs> just got to make sure we understand the text, the reference. It's throwing rocks, not puff, puff, pass. Okay. <laughs> they were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. Listen. They went about, listen, in, in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and what? 
mistreated. Does that sound like a nice little story you want to read about? And you know what I mean? Chicken soup for the soul. Let's talk about little Johnny who lost everything and followed Jesus. These guys lost it all. Men and women lost everything. But then it says this. Verse 38 should just it, humble us. Talking about the people we just read about. Of whom the world was not worthy. Can you imagine when you see people that die for their faith? And we say, oh my gosh, and on the earth's view is, oh my gosh, it's so horrific, and it is, and it's so horrible, and it is. But yet when they walk into the presence of Jesus, Jesus says to them, your faith wasn't even worthy. They, they weren't even worthy to see what you did. Only heaven can see how, how great you are. The, I think sometimes the church tries so hard to be worthy on the earth that we fail miserably being worthy in heaven. I think if we change it, I think if we do a shift and we say our church needs to be worthy of heaven's audience, not so much of the world's audience. And he says, keep reading, says this, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All of these, though commend through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. They didn't receive the promise on the earth. They received the promise in heaven, the presence of the Lord. That's faith. Faith is looking at every situation knowing that God's working it out. And if God chooses to allow my life or your life to fall because of our faith, then it's God has something better for us. And he says this, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Let me say this to you. Your faith gives you a defense and an ultimate victory. Your faith is everything. Your faith is everything. When I was a kid, my mom tells me this story about when she got saved. My mother heard the gospel twice. The first time she was 16 years old, before she had children, and she heard the gospel. The pastor gets up and says, if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior, just walk the aisle, come forward, and we'll pray with you. She said at 16 years old, she was standing there in church, and she gripped the back of the chairs, and her knuckles were white, and she refused to leave. She knew God wanted her to walk, but she didn't. The second time she was at church, she was 21 years old. This time, two kids on the verge of her second divorce. She had my brother at 19 and had me at 21. Second time, her world's falling apart. She goes to church again a second time. She hears the same message, and she says, if the guy tells me to come forward, I'm going. And sure enough, the pastor says, if you want to today receive Christ your Lord and Savior, just step out and come forward. My mother says she released the chair, and she walked, and she just just made a beeline to the front and she gave her heart to Christ she gets home and tells my father says I just went to church and I just gave my heart to Christ God's changing my life everything's going to be great and I just think you should come to church too this is what he said he said if you stop going to church I'll come back and be your husband my mother said how can I give up the only thing true that I found in my life. And she said, I want you to stay, but I cannot give up Jesus. And my father packed up the stuff and left. Listen to me. Sometimes in life, Christ might be that incredible breakthrough that you need, but sometimes in life, people are going to be upset with that decision. But he has to be more than anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? And my mother has stood behind her faith, her shield of faith, and she has lived that commitment to this day and has not regretted anything. She went on for five years to pray for his salvation and pray that there would be reconciliation, but no reconciliation was ever found. He never gave us a dime. He left us with $15 and two months' worth of bills. Listen to me. That was literally our life. So my, after he leaves... He, he, but he was great, though. He took the car and left the car seat. Such a sweet man. 
So he's putting all of his stuff in the car, pulls the car seat out. He takes off and leaves. It's Sunday. My, my mom is just, she's crying. So what does she do? Like any, any good mom, she goes, I don't know what to do. So she takes my, uh, me, puts me in the stroller, and takes, and takes my, um, my brother. And we start walking down the street, and she's just sobbing, and she's praying. And she's going, God, okay, I just gave you my life. I just gave you everything. I have, I have nothing. Listen to me. I have nothing. And so she's walking down the streets in Jacksonville, and she's crying, and she's in our neighborhood, and she has this friend. Um, his name is, uh, I, think, I think his name is Gary. And so he, but he, drove a, he drove a Volkswagen Beetle, and he's driving everywhere looking for my mom. Finally sees her, gets out of the car, and goes, you, he goes, Candy, I've been, I've been looking everywhere for you. He, he goes, you, you, you're just not going to believe this. He goes, I just did my tax return, and I got back more money, and I asked the Lord what I should do with my tax return, and he said that I should give it to you. And so she is just crying, and she's like, well, he's just, you know, my husband just left, and we have $15. I don't have any money for anything. He goes, here, and pay me back whenever you want, or if you don't, I don't care. See, sometimes the world will take things away from you in your faith, but sometimes God says, but I have something else for you. You have to understand God's character. He doesn't do that to put you in a bad situation. He, that was my mom's first big lesson of faith. That was her lesson. Do you trust me with everything? And she said, Lord, I'll give everything to you. That story is a true story. That's my life. I believe that I'm a pastor today because I had a mother who chose the Lord. I believe I do this today because of promises that he gave her. You understand that sometimes that Jason was not worthy. Listen, this sounds weird when I say it this way, but Jason wasn't worthy. I didn't, I didn't want Jason to grow up in that guy's house. I didn't want him around Jason and Chris so that I can train Jason and Chris of what I wanted from, from them, from me. And I believe as a direct result of what the chaos in our lives at that time, I believe God brought something special in us. And sometimes what we, if you'd ask my mom in that moment, would you want to save your marriage? She would have said, yes, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. But you can't force that on other people. She goes, but I will give God everything, including my sons. And she said this was her prayer. She goes, my, my husband, my second husband has left now. At 21 years old, you have to raise my boys. You have to be their father have to stand behind your faith because that's what will protect you. That's what he's talking about when he says the shield of faith. To pick it up. Because you can try to live in this world any way that you want, but if you don't pick it up, it's not going to do you any good. Make sense what I'm saying? You fight this violently because you live in violence, and the way you fight it violently is you pick up that sword and you remind yourself you are in a battle and you are in a war. And he says to stand firm, stand your ground, stand behind your shield. Because if you're behind your faith, nothing can hurt you. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. <laughs> just want you to take a moment to just thank the Lord for what he's done for you. John tells us this in 1 John 5, 4. He says, every child of God, every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. You're going to win. But the winning comes from the Lord. And he needs you to be obedient and full of faith. Father, we come before you, and we're humbled by your word, and we're just so thankful that you just give us this deep, incredible truth. But you make it so simple for all of us to understand. And I pray, Lord, that this church, that we understand that we are in a battle, and that the battle and the war is raging, and that we must stand behind our faith and not give in to what Satan has, but we, we hold firm, and we stand our ground, and we trust that what you're doing in our lives is greater than anything that Satan can do.
So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we honor you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, church. Thank you. We just want to say thank you so much for worshiping with us today. It is such an honor to have you with us. And, you know, I just want to get, I just want to say thank you to all of the people who make it possible today, whether it was cleaning tables or setting up or whether you're doing tech or the live stream or whether it's worship or whether you do youth or whether you do kids, you are, you are what makes all of this happen. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We're so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We could not do this without you. And this, you know, this past week, we celebrated our third birthday as Renewal Church, which is awesome. Yes. And, you know, we, we're, we have this tremendous building that's going up on Abbey Lane. And people keep asking us when. And, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Karen Owen this week, and she said, you know, it's almost like the ninth month of your pregnancy. It <laughs> takes forever. And I'm like, she's so right. Okay, so there are a few things that still have to take place, but exciting things are happening. Flooring's going in. Carpeting's going on the stage. They're, they're working on tweaking the sound and the lights. There's still a lot that has to happen. I mean, we, we need a Christmas miracle for the details. So if you would, please continue to pray. And we're so grateful for those of you that have been praying with us. You're our prayer warriors. And thank you so much for that. So this Tuesday, again, um, our ladies will be meeting for our prayer walk. We've been doing a prayer walk in the parking lot. We do, <laughs> we do seven laps around the parking lot. And as you were talking about the walls of Jericho, um, I... <laughs> questioned whether or not we had something to do with any of the delays but <laughs> but the walls are still strong. the walls are still strong it's the number seven is the number of perfection so um i i know we personally won't be there we have a funeral to go to mike Dorr's father passed away so if you'll pray for that family i know that they covet your prayers um but there are ladies that will continue to carry the torch so if you're a lady I encourage you to come out. It's so super powerful. No matter how tightly wound you get uh, based on how your week is going, I guarantee you by the time you round those, those rounds in the parking lot, you get unwind. And as you end that prayer walk, you feel rested in the Lord knowing that he's in control and that he's going to take care of it all. So I encourage you, if you get stressed out, come out on Tuesday at 6 o'clock. So on Wednesday is youth right here, not for long, but right here still. So um, youth, make sure that you have that you take the opportunity to meet up here. Um, and then this coming Sunday, we have a ladies ornament exchange. It'll be right up here at three o'clock. And what that means is we need you ladies. This is your personal invitation, but we do need you to RSVP for it. So if you would sign up at renewalchurch.com, um, there's, we just need you to let us know that, that you're coming so that we can plan for paper products and other things. So if you would, this is how it works. You bring a $10 ornament to exchange and some, uh, some food to share. So we're asking this year that you bring something prepackaged, like from the bakery or, you know, like from the Publix Deli or something so that we, we can make sure that everyone is comfortable and, you know, uh, all the health concerns and everything else. So um, we're, tr we're doing our best to make things happen. We're continuing to socially distance. And, and if you're coming here, our church doesn't look like it always did, but we're continuing to do this, and we're, we're so grateful that we can. So um, we're, we're, we're doing the best that we, can, that we can to celebrate, and we as ladies are going to get together and do that. So if you want to wear a mask, if, you want, if that makes you more comfortable, please, we invite you to come out and share in this time. Um, you know, we, we come in, we bring an ornament, and we, we call it an exchange, but it's more like... Um, like a free-for-all stealing. We do a white elephant, and um, it, it gets violent, Pastor. I'm not going to lie. So, like, but, um, but we have a really great time and, and lots of great laughs, and I know some of you could really use a good laugh. So, ladies, we encourage you, please come out um, and be a part of this. So I do want to let you know that we, do, that we are making Christmas Eve plans for a service. Now, we don't know exactly where it's going to be yet. We, we do know where it's going to be. Yeah. Okay, so we don't know where it's going to be yet. Um, we're just leave it at that, but it, it, it's going to be around 6 o'clock-ish. So we'll have more information for you as soon as possible. 
Um, thank you so much for your patience and for your understanding. And I know for those of us who are, are planners and control freaks, um, it's really difficult to have faith and to trust. So thank you for that message today because that was very timely, very, very timely. But we, we do plan to have a Christmas Eve communion. You and wrote it. I mean, I mean you should. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, I did not write that one. I trust. Um, so I just want to encourage you um, to stay connected. If you're not signed up for our newsletter, make sure that you are signed up for that. You can do that through our website as well, renewalchurch.com, and you will be the first to know as soon as there are uh, changes with our building or with our plans or where, where the location is going to be for our Christmas Eve and what we're doing with that. So with that being said, if you don't mind um, exiting to the left, if you're not checking out kids, these big brown doors and down the stairs, if you are checking out kids, please exit through these doors as well, but to the right and down the stairs through the kids' ministry. And if, uh, as always, if you need to use the elevator, you can use the elevator. So we just want to say how much we love you. Um, God bless you, and we hope and pray that you have a great week. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.